everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we discuss the week's hottest legal topics. It is the week of Valentine's in February 2024, and it is hard to figure out what is the hottest topic or list of topics when we have so many. So stay tuned with us through this episode. We're going to hit multiple topics. If you like any of these topics, stay tuned. Make sure we get to talk about your favorite topic and click like and subscribe along the way so that you can catch our next episodes and so that we can get out to other people who also might like the weekly wine. So here are our topics. We're going to talk about the New York fraud trial, the criminal one. I'm pausing here because there are so many. So the criminal New York trial that will be going ahead this week, the court ruled that there will be no continuances. The court will proceed for trial, jury trial, as planned in March. So we're going to talk about that as well as break down again why this case is going forward as a criminal trial. We are also going to talk about Fonnie Willis. There was um, quite lively testimony this week, interesting testimony from Fonnie Willis, as well as the other prosecutor alleged to, to be in this, I guess, quote, scheme. So we're going to break down that testimony, see, give a couple opinions on that. We are also going to talk about last week's court um, arguments in the Supreme Court regarding the 14th Amendment. Um, those were also lively. We want to talk about what the justices said, what they asked. Those are really what we're um, going to break down is what questions did they ask and what do they implicate? What are the possible outcomes that we think might be happening based on the justices' questions? Um, We have a couple other things. Dr. Vile, remind me what the other topics we have are because there are so many. Oh, okay. We've got Mayorkas, the impeachment of Mayorkas. We also have Biden. Okay, so we have two different um, issues on Biden. Stay two tuned. Bidens. Two different Bidens. You're right. So stay tuned. There's Hunter Biden, where this week we have claims against, I believe it's an FBI agent who is claimed Informed. to, informant, thank you, who is claimed to have lied about the money that may or may not have been given to foreign countries by Hunter Biden, and it seems to be a lie now. Um, That's the claim, and that's what's being charged against this FBI informant. The other thing, which probably is really hot right now to most people, is the information that has come out regarding the, the documents that Joe Biden had in his garage, in his car, wherever they were found, um, the the confidential documents, how that's different from Trump's because Trump is being charged and Biden is not. And the idea behind it that has come out is that Joe Biden's memory is really, really bad. And that's the reason for declining prosecution. But what does that mean for the elections? Um, that's, That's one reason. Yes, that that's is one not, reason that was not given. actually the primary reason. And I think I think the news is a little off on that. Yes. Uh, so it, it was the reason that's been picked up in the media. And I right. think that the public has had the most outcry on um, and has caused even Joe Biden to have very strong comments about um, in the media And in some ways, I think people have used even his own comments to continue to perpetuate the idea that he is truly unfit based on his own memory. So we're going to talk about all of these. I know we've got about an hour. Um, Stay tuned with us. If you don't hear one topic you like, skip to the next topic. We have quite a few because they are all hot legal topics for the week of Valentine's. I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm with um, Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer tell you you do. I'm based in Maryland and I do Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. I also am joined by Chelsea Rogers, who is another attorney in our office. Welcome, Chelsea. Oh, Oh, I was muted. Hi. There we go. (laughs) There we go. Hi, Chelsea. Thanks for joining us again. 
<laughs> and Dr. Vile is also joining us. He is the Dean of the Honors College of Middle Tennessee State University, and he is a constitution expert. So he is an expert in all things constitution, amending process, and constitutional law. And uh, you were definitely key this week regarding um, Joe Biden, these arguments before the Supreme Court for the 14th Amendment issue. Um, and Chelsea, I'm very excited to have you recap the New York York criminal trial uh, that is proceeding against Trump. So let's get started. Quick question about the wine. Um, Chelsea, I know you're a little bit different this week. What are you drinking? I'm switching it up a little bit. I have in my very fancy wine glass, uh, Welch's white grape juice, you know, switching it up. It's still <laughs> great. Um, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, same vibe, just like, <laughs> a little toned down. <laughs> All right. And Dr. Vio, have you got your trusty water? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, my friend Mark Clark gave me a buy, and I hope this doesn't have to do with my age, uh, <laughs> anti -doc an antioxidant infusion. I see. Uh, Brasilia blueberry. Uh, uh, very nice. And is it tasty? Uh, it has a little, it's only 10 calories, and so it has a little bit of that artificial taste to it. But otherwise, I, I do like blueberries. So, yes, it's fine. Excellent. Okay, so I'm the only one drinking wine today, and that's fine because I have chosen one of my very favorites. It tastes a lot like port. Um, so to me, it's lovely. It's more of a dessert wine. Um, you can see how beautiful the color is. It's a dark, sweet wine. Um, it's called wine. It is called red wine. It's MV Ruby, and it's by our, our favorite winery, the Mariah Winery, um, where we pick it up in Manassas, Virginia. And technically, it's from Bealton, Virginia, um, which is right around the corner from Manassas. But that's what I'm drinking. I felt that today that's the way that it should go for Valentine's. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. All right, let's start off with the New York criminal case against Trump. What we have this week was a very short argument for a continuance that Trump brought saying, look, this campaign is continuing on. I really need to be focusing on the campaign instead of sitting for a criminal trial. And the court shot it down very, very quickly. I mean, I think it was ten within 10 minutes they said, no, you are going forward with this trial in March. So we now have what's going to be the first criminal jury trial for Trump. And he's got four different ones pending. He's been trying to put them off. And this is the one where it says, no, here we go. It's going in March. Uh, Chelsea, break down for us what this criminal trial is about. Yeah, I felt like this is a blast from the past. We covered this, you know, um, a while ago. It feels like forever ago, but I guess it wasn't that long. It was um, last spring. We broke it okay, down. Yeah. And I'm going to put um, at the end of the video, there's going to be some videos that pop up. I will put it at the end. I will also put a link to it in the description. So if you really want the entire breakdown and analysis of what these, these case, the indictments are about, which... Um, which charges are what and why they're there, why there are 34. Um, we have a huge analysis of that. Go back through and listen. But Chelsea, give us the overview. I'll give you the overview. It's really easy. Everyone's going to recognize this case because it's about Stormy Daniels, but not, right? Like that's what the news is saying it's about, but it's not really. But it mm -hmm. is about the payment that... Um, Cohen made to Stormy Daniels on Trump's behalf. But what the actual charges are and why it's broken down into 34. Did I say that right? It's 33 you did. 34. Yeah, it's there it's we go. 33 of there And then there's 11, the one. Okay. Yeah, there yeah, there's are 11, 11 transactions. Instances, yeah. 11 transactions, um, each being charged with three separate counts, essentially. And it was like accepting a payment, incorrectly inputting it, and essentially the output. It's essentially 11 different instances of Trump paying Cohen back for the hush money payment. Um, but the thing is, is that like the accounting on it was questionable. It was fraudulent. Um, and he's being charged with these counts because they're making the claim that there's an underlying crime of like election fraud, campaign finance fraud, and that that makes these fraudulent business transactions um, in furtherance of an underlying crime. And so we're at a felony level and 34 counts of it. 
Yeah. I think, I think the biggest thing is, is ultimately to look at it as tax fraud yeah. is, is how this is, is going. That's, that's not quite the way that it is, but it's close enough to, to have the overall idea of what this is. It's very similar to the civil trial yes. that was undergoing for New York, where, where they're saying, Hey, you covered up, you're, you're claiming all of these things are, are correct, but they're really not. Um, like you, you claim that you have millions of dollars more than you actually have. You claim that you're, you're, your penthouse apartment um, has this many square feet and then that time has this many square and, feet, you know? And that case, by the way, will probably be decided today. Correct. It is so, the Friday. Yeah. Uh, we're a little bit earlier than it's come down. Um, so if it does come down, we're going to do a little bleep and put it into, we're going to input an extra conversation. So you'll see that in a little bit, but if it doesn't, we'll continue as normal. Uh, but yes, that's the one where the the New York Attorney General, through a civil case, is saying, you know, you falsely reported all of this stuff. You've exaggerated your numbers in order to take advantage of taxes, to get more money, to get better loans, to get better advantages, and to take advantage of other people. They in- suffered economic loss because of it. So that's why they did the civils. They're like, you know, anyone you've interacted with, this impacted so many different institutions that you have defrauded the people and there's real economic damage because of it and they deserve to be compensated, which is an interesting argument um, in this type of case. It, it is. So it's extremely similar. Um, but what the New York district attorney, the criminal attorney, is saying is this particular scheme was right before the election that the payoff to Stormy Daniels by Michael Cohen on behalf of Trump was in order to hush her before the election so that he didn't have mud on his face before the election so that he could gain the presidency. And then later it could come out and it wouldn't hurt him because he would already be president. He he wouldn't have any more mud on his face. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. There had been other revelations of similar uh, at, at activities here. But, but not we, so the, close to the election. Right, one of the fascinating things that we'll get to when we, when we talk about the arguments for the Supreme Court is one of the fascinating things about this case is it occurs before Donald Trump is elected president. Correct. Yes. So even if the Supreme Court were to rule against him, to rule in his favor and say that he has absolute immunity for anything he did as president, this occurred before that. Well, it didn't. It didn't. The <laughs> hush money payment was beforehand, but right. the actual charges are for what he did when he became president. So the first year of his presidency in 2017 is when he, he the wrote the oh, checks yeah. where he did falsifying business records is what the charges are. And that's when he wrote the checks or authorized the checks through the Trump Foundation and the tr- the revocable trust. And then they issued right. the trust, um, the, the checks from the trust to Cohen. So there's three different pieces for each 11 payments. Mm-hmm. And those were made during his presidency. So Yes, and that's what the issue is, is but, the accounting of them, right? Because like, mm-hmm. it's totally legal to pay somebody to be quiet and have them sign an NDA. That's not a crime. Right. Um, but lying about it and calling it legal services and making your business pay it back when this is truly, a, I mean, a, an electoral expense, a personal expense and not a business expense is where it gets the problem comes in, right? Exactly. Well, and, and, and in this case, there's no way you can argue that it's even within the outer bounds of what you're obligated to do as president. I can't imagine. But, yeah. you're, you're paying your, I mean... Even if it wasn't for Stormy Daniels, if you're paying off your attorney for <laughs> for his services, that's not for the White House activities. And one, one well, Michael past- Cohen got lucky because he's one of the only attorneys that's been paid, but that's on another. <laughs> on another well, but he, he also ended up in jail for it. True, and true. One of the problems with this case is that his testimony as a witness yeah. is not going to be terribly credible, but... Presumably, it's backed up with physical evidence. Yeah. It uh, is. Checks that have been signed and uh, his testimony as to what they went to. So I, I think it's a pretty pretty solid case. Exactly. Uh, we will see. We'll find out think, on March 25th. Yeah, I think the only difficult 
or what I anticipate to be more difficult than the rest of it is not the accounting of it, but it's going to be the underlying crime that brings it to the level of a felony. I think that's right. where they're going to have to really have the documentation to, to make that clear. I agree because each of them without an underlying crime is a misdemeanor. The falsifying business records in New York is a misdemeanor. What rises to the level of the felony, Chelsea, you're absolutely right, is that there's an underlying crime that's being committed, and that's why it would be a felony. So I agree. I think the catch in this case will be, can they prove the underlying crime to bump it up? And maybe in the end he'll be convicted, but maybe it will all be for misdemeanors. Because exactly. Dr. Vial, you're right. The the proof is is pretty solid as to the checks were written. Yeah. Um, they alleged legal services, but the other the attorney for Stormy Daniels can testify as to what was mm-hmm. received and when and what the communications were. There are other people who can testify as to the communications as to how Michael Cohen would be paid back. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe there's actually a document regarding here's how we're going to pay you and we're going to double or triple the amount. So it ended up instead of 130, which was paid to Stormy Daniels, I think it ended up in 400 something thousand. Um, So it'll be interesting. That's coming up and we will absolutely cover it um, as it continues in March. For sure. I think the takeaway is that if you're paying somebody hush money, just account it properly. You know, I think that's what we can all learn from this. Or from Fonnie Willis paying cash. There we go. Yes. Okay, so hold Fonnie Willis for just a little bit because that's a great segue. Um, but I don't want to leave the the New York civil case. Um, so, Dr. Vile, you did say for today, um, it's the Friday. It is supposed to be coming down. What's your prediction as to the judge's decision about the civil case? I think he's already told us that they're not arguing as to whether fraud was committed. Correct. The question is, what is the penalty going to be? Is it, you know, I think they've asked for what, $270 million? They've asked for more than they originally did. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I don't know. Um, Do you think, either of you, that that his business license for New York will be taken? Oh, absolutely. You do? Okay. I, I think so. Dr. Vile. Well, you know, I'm trying to connect this to the story today that True Social is about to go public and oh, might right. actually bring billions of dollars uh, to Trump. Some of, mm-hmm. its pay, some of its profit on paper rather than cash that you would have. I don't know if it would affect that or not. I, I, I'm assuming that would not be limited necessarily to what happens in New York. But to tell Trump that he can't do business and, and part of a, a lot of it will depend not so much on Trump as it may on to what degree does it affect his two sons yeah. uh, and the rest yes. of the organization. You know, the organization could probably continue without Trump. Um but particularly if his sons are implicated very deeply in this, that, that could be a, a pretty, pretty big blow. There seems to be a fairly broad consensus that Donald Trump Jr. would be caught up in this, that he will be found to be fully involved in the scheme, whereas Eric Trump may not be. Um, right. To me, it's, it's an interesting theory because I think they both have in my own mind and opinion, they both have equal responsibilities, different responsibilities, but responsibilities Mm -hmm. over the organization, and especially during Donald Trump's absence. Um, It's almost to me the the ploy of, well, I don't know anything. But if you're a business leader, even if you're Donald Trump's son, you're still Donald Trump's son and you're leading part of his business, to me, it's a hard cry to say I absolutely had no idea what was going on. Um, So if it's not you, then who is it? Tell us. It's this weird argument of like, I'm a business mogul. I am an expert, yet I know nothing that's happening in any of the businesses, right? Like, come on, be so for real. Be so for real. Uh, uh, Agreed. It seems to belie belief. Um, But 
we're going to see. I don't think Eric Trump is going to be implicated as much as the others. He may even be fully taken out. Um, I agree that I think his license will be taken. Um, I also believe that the higher amount that we're going to get closer to that higher amount that was requested rather than the original request. Now let's go to Fonnie Willis. Um, And Dr. Vile, I I know, I think you have the strongest opinions and uh, thoughts on the Fonnie Willis case. So I'd like for you to take this one on as far as a, let's do a summary and then a deeper dive into what in the world happened with the testimony. Well, the issue here is whether Willis and an associate prosecutor, Wade, had a romantic relationship. Now, that's not what, that's the salacious part mm-hmm. uh, because one, you know, this could get into, I mean, I don't think there's an accusation of sexual, uh, s- sexual harassment. Correct. But it typically seems consensual. A boss, typically a boss does not have a relationship with a subordinate uh, who's continuing on the job. But the, the more important issue in terms of the case is whether whether either Willis or Wade is profiting financially by this prosecution. Was Wade chosen because they were lovers? Mm. Uh, Was he paid more than he should have been? Did one buy, you know, was Wade buying trips for Willis uh, as sort of payback for being hired? But the, the, the interesting thing about the whole case and, and to, to go to the case yesterday, I mean, it, it was fairly riveting, uh, if you like, Peyton Place. Um, hey, I mean, you know, it was better than a romance novel playing it, it, well, out in you court. Know, a lot of testimony, you know, <laughs> when did you start sleeping with one another? How many times? Where did you do it? I mean, a lot of stuff like this that for most of us Awful. would be very embarrassing. And I will say, you know, that they had very different personas. Uh, Wade came across, now they were both feisty. Wade both insisted that after they answered a yes, no, that they were going to give an explanation. And the judge generally let them do that. Uh, But what I think one of the most fascinating parts to me was soon after Wade got off and Willis got on, she made the comment, she said, you know, Wade is a, is a Southern, Southern gentleman, me, not so much. (laughs) Uh, And she, you know, frankly, if I had her as a witness, if I were crossing her, I would be very upset because she nightmare. tried to make speeches continually. And I understand why she did it. You know, she believes that that these accusations against her are lies, that, there, right. you know, there was no financial benefit. And as she points out, she's had to give up her house. Uh, she's been accompanied by... Uh, I don't know, the equivalent of Secret Service, I guess it right. wouldn't be secret. You know, she's had to have, uh, she's had to watch her every move, and you know, to to think that she's doing it for financial gain does seem to stress a little bit of credulity. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was very, I mean, she gave a lot of speeches yesterday, <laughs> and yeah. for the most part, got by with it. Um, although she was admonished a number of times by the judge that she had gone you know, a bit too far. Uh, but it's, yeah. you know, it's fa- it's fascinating. I'm not sure that she was obligated to testify. I think she might have been, might have been able to avoid it, but she wanted to. I mean, she, yeah. she wanted, wanted it out there. The, the, the irony of all of this is in some ways, it makes absolutely no difference with respect to the charges that Donald Trump interfered in the Georgia election. Right. Those facts are facts, you know, whether completely whether separate a romantic relationship or, or even if it, even if there was payment between these two attorneys, it would not necessarily go to the facts. But if it's, fa- if it's found that either of their behaviors was such that they should be taken off the case, then, you know, do we go back to square one you have to have a whole new prosecutorial teams. I mean, this would, the, Trump loves delay. Right. Uh, that's why he was so upset by this first case we talked about. If you had to start from, 
I guess you wouldn't exactly start from scratch. Right. And then the other question that I don't know as a non-attorney is we need to remember we've had at least three, maybe four people who have already pled guilty. Yes. Would they then could they then withdraw their pleas on the basis that, well, I made it with this attorney, I didn't make it with this district attorney? I don't know the answer. Maybe one of you do. Possibly. I, I think it, in my mind, it, I'd, I'm with you. I don't think it ultimately matters. But I think it matters in the court of public opinion. Yes. Yes. And absolutely, I, again, I go back to last week. I think it was a foolish decision. Yeah. Whether it li- rises to the level of an unethical you mean the, decision. The decision to be de- having a romantic relationship. Correct. I think yeah. if this were a relationship between Fonnie Willis and a witness. Oh, absolutely. Right, then there's no right. question. I mean, we're talking about improper influence. Yeah. Of a witness testimony. If this were between her and defense counsel, there would be no question. Um, but I, I go back to, and this is, <laughs> I'm going to use my own experience as a prosecutor. There were multiple times as a prosecutor and even as a defense attorney in multiple jurisdictions. Um, so I was both a defense attorney and a prosecutor in Virginia in different dur- jurisdictions. So I'm hopefully not giving too much away um, for personal um, reasons for people who were involved. But there was one jurisdiction where um, a prosecutor ended up marrying a police officer who she worked with often. Now, ultimately, once they were married, they were taken off each other's cases and put on different cases, Um, but it was a norm. You know, they worked together. They were constantly doing cases together, and they were just afterwards removed from their own cases. There was another jurisdiction where um, one prosecutor in the office ended up marrying another prosecutor in the office, a prosecutor down the hall, right? They ended up having a relationship, but... Nobody cared. It was, you know, okay, so they didn't try cases together. They w- weren't put in the same courtroom afterwards, et cetera. So, so there were these different relationships that happened, but as long as they weren't with, you know, the witness on the case they were trying, right. um, then it was viewed as, well, it's not great, but it's not horrible. And then just going forward, they would avoid the appearance of impropriety. But the, so, the complicating factor in this case is the implication that they were they were giving money back and that Willis that, that Wade right. was profiting financially because and and he was sort of paying off Willis for hiring him because mm-hmm. of the way the vacations that they took. And right. you know Willis has a has a very interesting defense. She did, which I mean, she basically and she's setting herself up. You know, she keeps from a th- you know thousand dollars to fifteen thousand dollars in her house or on her person wherever she goes. Uh, and I mean, yeah. Chelsea, I don't know if this is good advice for you or not. But apparently, <laughs> if you go on a date. You need to have at least two hundred dollars in case the guy stands you up. So hey, yeah, let me take down some, <laughs> some notes there. <laughs> yeah, she claimed that she paid him back. She right. she did yeah. claim that for for they various split reasons expenses, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. that he would pay, he would make the reservations, and she would take out her cash and and give it to him, um, which is odd. It's not normal. I don't think many of us would do that. Honestly, if someone paid, I'd write them a check or Venmo them. You, I was you know. say, are we writing checks? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I write checks. <laughs> I think I've written a check like twice ever. <laughs> I still write checks for my business. It's not unknown right. for me. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, I think the normal would be like to Zelle or to Venmo money, yeah. PayPal, that sort of thing. But in her testimony, she's like, well, I pull out all this cash and I pay him back, which is odd, but it's not necessarily... It's not illegal. It's it's no. definitely not illegal. And she traces it, by the way, to her father. She says right. her father told, you know, and she partly traces it to being African-American. Oh, interesting. Um, that, 
you know, you never know what might happen. You need to have some money in your house or on your mm -hmm. person at all times. Um, I, I, th I mean, I think it came across as very credible. I mean, she came across as very genuine. And I tell you what, Feisty. she whetted my appetite for, I want her to stay on the case because I would love to see her cross-examine uh, Donald Trump or any other witnesses. I mean, it, Put me on notice, you know. I, she is not, not going to go to around. Georgia and commit any crimes. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. that I would anyway. But I hope she's kept on the case. I hope this is seen. I, I mean, honestly, maybe one or both of them is taken off. Right. Um, I don't believe it should affect the the trials, the cases. So maybe the rest of her office is kept on. But I don't think. To me, it defies credulity. I'll use your word that the others in her office would not also be working on the case already. It's hard to right. believe that she and Wade would be the only people who are aware of this case right. and working on this case. So if you take them off, take them off, but keep the office on. There are two people. I hope they're not taken off. Um, right. Again, I think it's ill-advised decisions. I think if they take someone off, take Wade off um, rather than her. But I just, poor, poor decisions that really shouldn't have been made, especially the when doing this kind of has case. Greater responsibility for the behavior than the subordinate. True. So very you know, true. But again, I'm not. I, I would love to see her stay on just because. I, I, if if this is a four ten things to come, we ought to serialize it. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I love that. That's your reaction because I feel like so many times. I, when you see an attorney who's on the witness stand, they come off really inauthentic and yes. not super genuine. So I think it's interesting that she really does. I mean, she seems sincere, which I like. Yeah. They, it, both, they both to me sounded yeah. uh, sincere. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite a contrast to Donald Trump. I, I mean, yeah, I would think it would be fairly embarrassing to have to, Tell people who you slept with and when. I mean, it, you know, oh my sort goodness. of none of their business typically. Uh, yeah, tries to cover it up, and they basically admit to it. Yeah, they I mean, they yeah. both did. I think the issue is the timing. Right. Um, is whether right. it was beforehand. Dispute. Right. right. And yeah. there was the witness who claims, you know, look, it was before it was before right. she hired him. Right. She and Wade both say no. It was after he was brought on. Um, in which case it seems less like a bribery <laughs> or, a, you know, payment for services if right. it was afterwards and because they were working together, they became close um, yeah. and had the affair. But there is the claim by this witness that it was prior to her hiring him. And I think that's where it does become a little bit more murky. Again, I don't think it's I don't think it's something that where you say, well, the grand jury's decision to indict becomes mm -hmm. null and void, yeah. but I, I mean, think it would rise to the, well, let's right. take them off. Where Willis is in danger is she gave a very, I thought, very persuasive affidavit, if it's true, right. to the original charges. Under oath, right, she can be prosecuted for perjury. So mm -hmm. if it turns out that she has perjured herself, then she doesn't belong on the case. Same would be true of Wade. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But right, it's yesterday, I mean, they really didn't follow up very much on the witness who testified that the affair had begun beforehand. Right. And, you know, and it's apparently it's sort of it was a witness, a former friend of Willis. They haven't talked in, in a couple of years. There was a big falling out. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, unless somebody else can sustain that person's testimony, I think, given, you know, again, the feistiness, but also the apparent transparency of what Willis was saying, I, I don't think it's going to be sustained. Right.
Well, let me make one more comment on this, and then we're going to move to the arguments in the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, Dr. Vile, uh, well, for those of you who don't know already, Dr. Vile is my father, um, which is is amazing for me, and I'm so proud um, to to be your daughter and to even be have you on here for you to choose to do this with me. But uh, in in talking about Fonnie Willis and the the cash she keeps. It reminds me of my grandmother, your mother, is yes. how much cash did she keep in the house? You would find it in cookie jars and under <sighs> mattresses. And, and I, I honestly think that once she passed and, and her stuff was put into to the, to the junkyard or to the, the dumpster out back, that you probably lost a ton of cash that if you <laughs> looked through those items were probably stuffed in there. So, so one of the most traumatic events in her life was her wedding day when an aunt pulls her aside and hands her $2 and says, you never know about men these days. <laughs> oh. And it really did sort of shake her. It's like, what? <laughs> well, what was the $2 for? Well, I think probably in part to make a phone call, maybe a long distance phone call. I'm not sure. But anyway, yes, fair it, it was $2 yeah. went a lot farther back in 1950, I believe it was, yeah. uh, than it does today. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, I still remember so much money. And, and honestly, one of the funniest comments, it's a little bit derailed, but I think people will appreciate it. So she had five children. Um, Dr. Vile is the, the eldest of five. And um, then she also raised two of her grandchildren. And one of the funniest memories I have growing up is we would visit often um, because my cousin was there and she was a year older than us. So we were like triplets. And um, she, she got a marketing call for Feed the Children or so, some such organization like that. And and um, they're like, okay, well, we want you to donate for this. You really want to feed the children. And I hear her <laughs> saying, I've already fed the children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> and no one could argue with that. So. <laughs> So in any case, let's get to the the Supreme Court. Last yeah. week um, was the the Supreme Court hearing for the Fourteenth Amendment claims that Trump should be excluded from the ballot um, as yeah. having done an insurrection or rebellion. Uh, Dr. Vial, I'm going to also put this to you. Chelsea, please feel free to to comment. We'll, we'll have a conversation. But Dr. Vial, what actually came out through this discussion and what did the justices ask and why does that matter? Yeah, let me start with how I think this diverged from the typical case. And I admit that I don't listen to all the cases that come before the court, but I've heard a fair number of them. What was unique about this case and so to put it in context, specifically, it's a case that came out of Colorado. Uh, now, right. there's a similar decision that was made in Maine, and there are other case, there are other states that are sort of waiting on the results of this to, to decide what to do. But Michigan, Colorado Maine. had decided, right? Colorado had decided that under se you know Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment prohibits people who have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and a subsequently committed insurrection, it prevents them from running from off for, for office. And so Colorado, uh, and it's actually Republicans who brought this suit, um, when it came to the primary, they said Trump is an insurrectionist. He does not, you know, just like you, if you file and you weren't 35 years old, you couldn't be, you know, you couldn't be elected. Uh, if you weren't a U.S. citizen, you couldn't be elected. They said he's an insurrectionist. He doesn't qualify for the ballot. And you'll remember uh, the lower court agreed that the trial court of record agreed that Trump was an insurrectionist, but using an argument uh, that one of my friends or sort of friends, uh, Seth Tillman and others made, said, but he's not an officer of the United States, right. which seems bizarre. Uh, but there are lots of arguments for for and against it. A regular common sense argument to a layperson 
seems to be, well, of course he's an officer of the United States. Isn't he the officer? Well, and it, right. A, a lot of it depends on whether, and there's been some, there's been some good scholarship even in the last week or two on this, whether an officer of the United States was a term of art as, you know, a very specific meaning mm-hmm. in a way that general officer is not. But basically, Colorado had tried to take him off the ballot. Right. That that had been stayed. The Colorado Supreme Court had said, yes, he is an officer of the United States. Yes, he can be taken off the ballot. But that opinion had been stayed until it got to the Supreme Court. Right. And what was interesting about the argument, you know, typically each side gets half an hour. It may have been a little bit more in this case. But usually you come prepared with a 20-minute argument expecting to be uh, interrupted for 10 minutes. And in this case, both sides gave a very brief opening statement, three to five minutes at mm-hmm. most, uh, and then said, we're open for questions. And it was, it was an exciting dialogue. I mean, it was, it was. You, you know, I love seminar classes. It was mm-hmm. much like a seminar. Each justice, uh, started raising questions. And in my, and I actually, you know, I I entered the case thinking that Colorado was right. They had every right to take him off the ballot. And by the end of it, not so sure. Um, Some of the justices said, well, isn't this giving a single state or states the right to make the decision for everybody? (laughs) And now this is more a political argument, which you don't typically expect to get before the Supreme Court. But one of the arguments was, well, in a politicized time such as ours, could it work both ways? Mm. Could people say, well, Biden is an insurrectionist because he allowed a loan to go through or he gave money back to Iran? Or Obama was an insurrectionist because uh, he had a drone attack that killed an American citizen abroad without, you know, without checking it through Congress. So I think there were some real, and again, these were almost more political arguments than others, but it it was interesting, the most recent justice, uh, Katanji Jackson, she's looked at the language of the 14th Amendment and says, well, this doesn't say a former president. And of course, the response was, well, it does say officers of the United States, but others are specifically enumerated. Doesn't it seem odd that you would, and of course, it, the argument works both ways. Right. Wouldn't it be odd if the only insurrectionist who could run for office would be the president <laughs> of the United States? So the argument cuts both ways. Uh, and and the, 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 the person arguing for Colorado said, you know, she said, well, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't this deny the votes of the American people? And he said, we're here because we have someone who tried to deny the votes of 80 million American people. Right. Uh, by proclaiming that he was president when when he wasn't, so it's a very fascinating argument. I my perception of the questions was that the questions seemed to indicate that the majority of the court was not going to allow Colorado to keep him off the ballot. Uh, but that's and that's only a perception. And and there's one other distinction to be made, which is there was an argument that if this kicks in, it doesn't kick in at the, at this stage, it kicks in after the election. Right. Right. Um, Right. And of course, part of this has to do, a lot of the 14th Amendment argument has to do with whether, whether a state can act on its own Mm -hmm. or whether it requires congressional authorization. Section five of the 14th Amendment authorizes Congress to enforce the 14th Amendment Right. What it doesn't make clear is whether whether some parts are self-enforcing or could they be state-enforcing. That right. this case has everything. It has federalism. It has you know presidential immunity. I mean, it's all there. Very exciting. It, it it is for legal scholars, for constitutional scholars. I mean, for all three of us, it's we're on the edge of our seats, yes. um, just waiting. So, so Dr. Vile, let me ask you this. Uh, I. 
I actually am on the same wavelength with you as far as the question seem to be saying, we don't want to leave it to the individual states to decide right. because one right. state could decide it for the entire nation. And how, how does that, how is that fair? How would that actually work? We've got each state deciding for themselves where this is a national matter. So is there a possibility then, or would it make sense, maybe, maybe either, for the, the court to say, okay, well, in the primaries, these are state primaries, they're deciding, we're not going to let each state decide based on their primaries, but what about the national vote? When it comes mm -hmm. down to the, the party who's um, accepted, essentially, by their 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 the person who's elected or su I can't nominated. come up with it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Nominated. See, this is where I get to the law versus the actual constitution <laughs> and the parties, um, the political part of it. You've got Dr. Vile. So if they're nominated by their own parties, is it such that they can say, well, at that point, look, we're, we're beyond the States. We're at the national level. He just can't be on the full ballot. He can't, you know, we won't let the individual so. I don't states think decide. Be time enough to get the suit taken care of. I think the argument right now is once he was elected, you could then make the argument. But the problem with that is, I mean, who wants to go against the judgment of the American people? You know, haven't they already exercised the judgment when they elected somebody rather than a court coming in? I mean, this is. This and is remove them. versus Gore squared or quadrupled or <laughs> yeah. right. whatever. Yeah, it's. I think I wonder if they're going to say, well, it's not ripe under this, where we're going to say the states can't do it, but we're not saying there's not another way. Right. Um, yeah. Chelsea, that, that what's your happen. thought? Honestly, this to me is one of the most confusing things to follow. Mm -hmm. And like, it's so yeah. complicated. And I think... I mean, I feel like I've said this a lot in my lifetime of like, you know, groundbreaking, first time ever. Um, I, I don't know. Like, this seems like a very novel issue. And like, I, is. I don't think I can even like comment on it intelligently, like, truly, because I don't know what, what creative legal ways might be found. And, um, and let's tie in now. Yeah. The yeah. other novel issue. Let's do it. Which the court is being asked to decide is whether a sitting president <laughs> has immunity, whether a president is immune yeah. for actions that he took, for criminal actions that he may have taken as president. Right, right. And, you know, does that apply only, you know, that there is some precedence to suggest yeah. that you do not mm -hmm. criminally charge a president While during his term. So... Right. Nixon was named an unindicted co-conspirator. Yes. And I believe that a similar similar precedent was followed, I believe, in, in Clinton's case. Yep. Mm -hmm. But Trump is essentially saying, well, it's combined with another argument. His argument is the only way to for a sitting president to be held accountable for criminal activity is through the impeachment process. And right. he further argues that if you had been impeached and not convicted, then it would constitute double jeopardy right. for you then later to be tried. I think that argument is specious. Yeah, uh, I think that's silly. It's, I think <laughs> what that was is the other silly. term we used yeah. last <laughs> Right. From an erudite perspective, I would have to say. <laughs> Go back to last week for the definition. <laughs> yes. Okay. You get the definitions in, in the last yeah, week. I think the vibes I, are off with that argument. You know, we'll just throw it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I swear, everybody. I Okay. I love Chelsea and especially her vibes. Um, for those of you who have been following us for over a year, this is true Chelsea. Um, and I think we're going to come up with a mug and or a t-shirt that is saying it's all about the vibes. The law is all about the vibes. The vibes. <laughs> um, because that is true, Chelsea. And honestly, the more I go, you've, you've radicalized my view of law. I've been working for 18 years. You've just become an attorney. And I'm like, no, yeah, the law is about the vibes. It's all about <laughs> it the vibes. That's, I wish that's I could have had her is. in a seminar. I would have enjoyed <laughs> into a 
I always tried to read re- read the class, and that would have been fun. Well, she can always audit a class. I'll pop in. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah. I think that's the thing of like some of these arguments are super silly. You know, as I said, the vibes are off. That <laughs> I think the idea that the impeachment is comparable to a criminal trial is just absurd. Like truly, I don't think there's any real weight to that argument. I think even just on a like facial look, that's not the same. You have different burdens of proof. You didn't have different audiences. It's just not mm-hmm. the same. Well, um, and the, one, one of the problems with the argument is – when you think that most crimes would not be ascertained during a person's term of office. Right. Not necessarily. If, you know, you, right. I mean. We'd hope not, you, right? Like, some right. are uh, obvious. Yeah. But. But you, you could easily commit, particularly, go, go back to the first case we talked about, yeah. particularly fraudulent documents. You might not find out till two or three years after a person's left the presidency. Yeah. And so your argument would be, the only way to do this would be, you know, and they're they're to get caught during the four year term. Whether, remember, in the second Trump impeachment, mm-hmm. there, there was a real question as to whether it was appropriate to impeach someone who was no longer in office. Right. 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 So you would essentially be giving a get out of jail free card yeah. uh, to anyone as president. And, you know, to I, I know this is a, a quite a different thing, but I, but I feel obligated to say a kind word on behalf of Alexis Navalny, uh, you know, who died yeah. in a Russian prison, mm-hmm. uh, apparently, you know, in the last day or so. Uh, we don't know that he was murdered, uh, yeah, but it certainly didn't help that he had been, you know, poisoned on a plane uh, and sent to Siberia. That certainly didn't contribute to his hell. Uh, do we want, do we, you know, do we want a Putin? Uh mm-hmm. And I, I'm not just talking about a Trump. I'm talking about anybody in the White House. Right. Uh, you know, do do we want to give what is the Harry Potter, which goes back to, to ancient Voldemort? Uh, well, he who must not be named. What, what is Dumbledore? What is, which one are we looking what is for? The, what is the magic <laughs> ring that you wear that makes oh. you invisible? Oh, right. Oh, the Deathly right. Hollow. This yeah, is yeah, an yeah. ancient myth. The Resurrection you know, you, Stone. Right. Would you Would you want? Would you want, would you, do you want to give that ring to the person who's president? Or that it's really more the wand, the elder wand. Okay, well. Would we want to give the elder wand? That's right. But I think if we're saying immune from criminal prosecution, impeachment also doesn't work. It's also during the four year terms. It's the whole Deathly Hollows package. Like we got all three going on. Like truly. (laughs) I love it. Harry Potter and the the American justice system. (laughs) By the way, Virginia, I don't know if you know this. But this last week, I was sort of made an honorary Swifty after taking listening to about two hours worth of Taylor Swift on the way to a conference with students. <laughs> I and, love this. <laughs> uh, the other thing that was a major event in my life. Uh, now I'm going to distort the story a little bit, but <laughs> I went into Bucky's just minding my business, and. Bucky found out that I was there and rushed up to get his picture taken with me. <laughs> oh, I love that. Incredible. I'm even more yeah. proud <laughs> than I already was. Look, the whole world is turning into Swifties. I love it. I, yeah. And, and Chelsea, Watch that be the most controversial thing we said during this whole thing. And that's what the comments are going to be about is, you know. <laughs> no, it's so true, especially with her conspiracy about Biden. Um, so there are a lot of conspiracy theories. So let's talk about Biden. Here we go. Yeah, We're going to transition to Biden. I talk love these transition. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk first about Hunter Biden. And then okay. let's go mm-hmm. to what I think is the most controversial this week is Joe right. Biden. Um, okay. So Chelsea, are you aware of the Hunter Biden situation? I am, but I think Dr. Vile explained it really well earlier. Prior to the um, conversation. <laughs> prior to our pre-conversation. Um, and I, I don't think I would do it justice. All right. We're well, going to punt it over to you, Dr. Vile. Yeah. Tell us what's okay. going on. So Hunter Biden is being charged essentially with taking money. Well, no, let's not, let me, now I may need to rethink it. So Hunter Biden was in the employee of the Ukrainian government, well, it wasn't a government, right? It was a corporation right. that was giving him That's far right. more business. Yeah. I'm going to look it up on my phone here. Right. <laughs> that, then he seemed to deserve, given his uh, credentials, but 
you know, probably partly because he was allied with the, with the Biden family. Right. He made made pretty good money on this. That has been ca- called into question, yeah. as has been, you know, I think the main question, it, it wasn't illegal for him to be a member of this, yeah. but did he file proper? Ta- he, he apparently right. admitted mm-hmm. that he hadn't paid taxes later. Uh, right. Did pay them. Uh, right. Had he made some false statements about it, this kind of thing. But, you know, a lot of people have been going, and this, you know, it's sort of a sad thing that that we involve family members in political, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you can't always help what a son or daughter or a parent does. And here Biden seems to have engaged in some illegal activities. I think part of it was he also owned it. He was a felon. Uh, or he, he right. was on probation and, and owned a gun that he wasn't yes. supposed to have. Right. He thought and he had plea bargained this it. out. And plea, yeah. bargain, plea bargain fell apart. But the, the question from the beginning has been, okay, Hunter, you know, Joe Biden has a sketchy son. He's yeah. admitted to being uh, addicted. He's admitted to all kinds of, you know, unseemly behavior, spending a lot of money gambling and that sort of thing. But what, what, if anything, does it have to do with with his father? Right. right. And the only link that I know and and understand, you know, not only was Mayorkas, and this is a this is a, an outrage, frankly, you know, not only has a cabinet member been impeached, basically not convicted. for sharing out, <laughs> just pardon? impeached by the House, but not convicted yes. by the right. Senate. Right. And not not only has that happened, but there have been. There have been attempts to impeach Joe Biden mm-hmm. on the basis of testimony of an FBI informant who said that right. five million dollars was passed. And I don't know if it was from the Ukrainian government or whether it was from a private entity, but five million dollars was passed to mm-hmm. Joe Biden. Ukrainian energy, energy company. And, and right. I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Bur- right. Burisma Holdings. Bur- Bur- yes. That's what I'm looking up. Yeah. Right. So. Essentially, the only tie that I know that any of those who have sought to impeach him, Biden, have Mm -hmm. found is here's somebody saying he got five million dollars. Right. If he got five million dollars and particularly if he didn't report it, that would that would be a serious offense. The person who is now prosecuting Hunter Biden, so is hardly a Biden supporter, is now also prosecuting the informant saying he made this up. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's a sad affair all, all the way around, frankly. All of it. But, yeah, but all of it's terrible. You know, I mean, you know, this could happen in any family. You, you, yeah. You, it, 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 you're, not ne- you're not necessarily responsible for what other family members do. Uh, but it, it looks like this is going to be the end of attempts to impeach Joe Biden. Yeah. Uh, so, well, for except for, for, right, for now. For now. Um, for now. So, right. Chelsea, let's catch this up. I think this is something you can talk about. Um, and mm. I agree. Dr. Vile, that was a great summary. I was going to say, like, <laughs> I knew I could not do that. <laughs> that. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to Joe Biden. This week, we've got a report that's come out, which is, frankly, quite pitiful. Um, but it has political implications. So what's happened with Joe Biden this week? Um, So we're back to the whole issue of presidents taking documents home that they shouldn't. You know, I thought that, like, we wore this issue out with Trump, but here we are again. We have Joe Biden being investigated for having classified documents where they're not supposed to be. Um, I believe it was his home, like his garage. Don't quote me on that. I think his um, car. Be, yeah, that's what I'm trying I could to be remember. filling in Something details about my own like, office and, and the garage. Yeah, yeah like my <laughs> own, you know, details to the story to, to keep it interesting for me. Um And essentially, we get this report, right? And this is my takeaway. And, like, you can go read the whole long thing if you feel like my my summation is not accurate. But they're like, uh, he's just an old man who can't remember what he does with things. It's like this weird – lots of commentary by people who are not medical professionals on his sort of mental state, his medical – like his mental uh, acuity, that type of thing. Instead of really – like, I don't really feel like the information about – the, the classified documents was all that entertaining, and it's not what anybody's talking about. It's it's talking about the commentary on his mental clarity, his ability right. to like recall dates and information, um, and in facts. And I think that has 
has the news buzzing because that's what the question is, is that we have someone who's a little bit older and whether or not there's been lots of throughout his presidency, lots of commentary on whether or not he's fit for office, if he's really sort of all there essentially, um, for lack of better words. And now we have this coming out. Um, and it had like a friendly tone. It didn't seem derogatory to me, but at it, least in the it had report. that undertone. At least, mm-hmm. in, yeah, that's what I'm, let me clarify. In the report, it was almost like, oh, he's just his friendly old grandpa who can't remember things. Um, was like the to, to the tone well, he would to come me. across as that is basically yes. what he said, which yes. made it a little more turning the knife. It's like, we're not really sure if he's sincere or not, but right. this is how he's going to come across to a jury. Absolutely. Um, so I think that was just strange. And now it's, I mean, now it's raising the question of, is he fit? Is he fit to be president? Um, and what does that mean if he's not? And of course, Nikki yeah. Haley says. Retirement age up to 70. Uh, you know, if we're going to use ageism, let's use it against both. You know, one's going right, to be one, right. take them both and out. The other, or 78, yep. the other's going to be 82. Yep. Uh, what works for the goose works for the gander. Let me go back, though, to a point that I made earlier, which I think is important. The The central problem with this, and in fact, I had somebody come up to me in church Sunday, mm. and he said, well, if you can't prosecute Biden for withholding documents, then the case against Trump has to fail. And my response was no. Uh, the primary distinction in this case was not... Mm how will we come across to the jury? The primary distinction was that Trump did not cooperate. Right. He right. denied, he tried to cover up. Right. And now they're even saying he may have had two rooms in Mor-a-Lago that, that were not disclosed and were never even searched. Yeah. So, it's the intention. Yes. Right. It's so, the so, specific intention to not disclose to keep them hidden, to take them versus mm-hmm. the idea of, I forgot that I even had them. Right. And mm-hmm. and remember, there's another person involved here, uh, at least one other, Mike Pence. Right. Mike Pence was also discovered to have documents in his house, oh. the mm-hmm. top secret. Yeah. And I'm not positive. I believe the same accusation may have been made against uh, Obama. You know, it's not uncommon for people to take documents, you know, I mean, well, it's not yeah. uncommon if, if you, you know, most presidents and ex-presidents and vice presidents, they write books. Right. Yeah. And so they want documentation there. They're not trying to do anything necessarily nefarious. But in right. Pence's case, as far as I can tell, uh, when he discovered he had documents, he said, hey, I got documents. Come search the place. Come get them. Uh, yeah. Well, let me if, give them if, back. If I have something that's not supposed to be here, take it. That's not what Donald Trump did. It's like, uh, I don't have documents. Is, and what he documents? hid them. He purposely <laughs> took them to Mar-a-Lago, allegedly. Right. Alleg- purposely <laughs> hid them in Mar-a-Lago and didn't want anybody to get them back, didn't want to return them to the congressional records, mm-hmm. and even allegedly showed them to other people and talked to them, talked about them. To other people. So I think the intent and the use of those records versus the yeah. the ones with Pence, with possibly Obama, the ones with Biden, there doesn't seem to be an allegation that they were used inappropriately, but that they were held and kept, that they were taken home, put in a box. Um, so sure, they shouldn't have had them. But the question is, what did they do with them and why did they have them and why did they keep them and were they returned, I think is the bigger issue. But let's talk about the implication to the presidency and the presidential election. Dr. Vile, I think the biggest question that I have for you as a political scientist and a constitution expert, not just a law expert, but an expert in the constitution in the amending process, is what happens, let's say there is a continuing outcry of he is not fit for presidency. He should not be and cannot be a president if he does have some form, even if it's not diagnosed or even if it's not published to the U.S., of some form of dementia. And again, let's let's do it for both candidates. Sure. Mm-hmm. The, the, I mean, Trump has made as many gaffes Recently, as Biden does, and and mm-hmm. we know Biden is actually a stutterer. He's yes. fought his whole life against it, and so 
he's had to be especially careful when he's, you know, he has to worry about whether he's stuttering in addition to the facts. So it's got to be pretty difficult for him to do this. So what happens if either candidate were, well, let's, 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 let's not wish it on e either of them. Obviously. Of course. But one of them, what if one of them, I mean, I mean, uh, am I right? Joe Biden had an aneurysm. Uh, I don't know. 15, that could 20 be years true. Ago. But if he's uh, 82 to 86 as a president, isn't it more right. likely that this possible dementia, I mean, it seems clear in the public and in well, the public again, eye. I, I want to be, especially at my age, I want to be very careful not to engage in ageism. <laughs> no, uh, of course not. You of know, course many not. cultures have, you know, the, there are certain mental facilities you may not be as quick as your as you age, but you do have greater experience. And in the case of, of someone course. like Biden, particularly who Especially has been his political a experience. senator since he was thirty right. years old, mm -hmm. uh, thirty two maybe it was, but you know somewhere along in there, th there are there is a value. You know, someone who may not be good at a spelling bee might be very good at. And now, you know, making making tough choices. Yeah. So we need to be very careful there. But essentially, you know, what could happen depends on when it would happen. If it happened before the convention, then you could end up with and if depending on how many primaries are left, if there are no primaries left, uh, you know, you might do what used to happen. People showed up at a convention and they chose the president. Right. Uh, they weren't committed necessary you know really the presidential primaries they started in the, they started in the 19 teens but they didn't become a prominent factor till till like the 19 late 50s or early 60s so it wasn't Where necessarily most, decried by the constitution as to how these no, would no, happen no no this is all parties aren't even mentioned except indirectly in one of the amendments so all of this you know you could go to a convention and you know convention comes to the conclusion. I mean, it, it could even be affected. I mean, think about this. Somebody who's committed to Donald Trump might change their mind if he were criminally convicted before the convention. They may have said, well, I, I've, I've thought that he was innocent all along. I no longer believe that. Uh, should we reconsider? So we could, we could go back to the old-fashioned days, you know, the smoke-filled rooms. Um, maybe they'd be vape filled rooms today. I don't know what they would be. <laughs> or, I mean, bourbon, uh, bourbon lu lubricated rooms or whatever they were. Oh, that's so good. But we that's could so easily go back to, you know, well, who, who, who are the, you know, who can we choose? Now, once the president is elected, once you get to January, I don't know if it would be December or January, but w once once the election has occurred, then the vice president of each one would be the one who would be the, the ob and, obvious. And one. that's the clear answer. I mean, yeah. under yeah. the Constitution, if the president is incapacitated or dies, clearly the vice president becomes the president. There's that succession ring according right. to the the Constitution. But... What happens truly, and I know you're talking about these smoke-filled rooms, but let's be a little bit more specific. What happens if Trump gets prosecuted? I mean, not just prosecuted, but gets convicted. What happens if Biden becomes incapacitated or is deemed incapacitated prior to the election? Let's talk about it in terms of the nomination well, at okay, these party conventions. The, right. If it's prior to the convention, the convention would decide. If it's between the convention and the election, I believe the leading party officials, each party has a process mm -hmm. where they would get together and choose. And you, you would think that the presumption would likely be in favor of whoever the vice presidential nominee mm -hmm. would be because they have... It, you know, if you're after the convention, the convention has endorsed. If you're endorsing somebody to be vice president, I'd mm. want to say Dan Quayle accepted, but that's probably uh, impolite. But <laughs> because he, he did come through in the in giving advice to Pence. But 
generally, if somebody, if the convention votes that somebody is eligible to be vice president and capable, then they're they're recognizing that if the president were to be incapacitated, this person, we would have confidence enough in them to to for them to be president. So I think what? the presumptive nominee would likely be the vice president. What about the conspiracy theorists? Because I, I have heard, and Chelsea, you're laughing, so I'm going to ask if you've heard the same thing that I have. There, there's this theory going around that at the convention, um, everybody's going to say, forget Biden. We're going to vote for Michelle Obama. Chelsea, have you, you heard this? Times. I thought we were going to vote for Taylor Swift. <laughs> I heard you. Well, right. What is going on here? <laughs> I mean, I have to laugh, and I have seen this on social media, and I have to think nobody is serious, right? Like this, ca- people can't actually believe this. Maybe I'm too hopeful about the the mental acuity of the general population, <laughs> but I hope nobody believes this, right? Like. It's ca- but you've heard this, so it's not yes. just me that there that there's this idea that everybody's just going to say, "Forget everybody who's been voted for in the primaries. Mm-hmm. We're going to, you know, vote for Michelle Obama." Right. And I mean, it's this sense of you know, I go back to George Washington and and, and Dr. Vile, you, you can can you know contradict me if I'm wrong. You know more about the founding fathers, but I have this idea and um, this this slight memory or the hope of a memory, that George Washington was one of these people who said, I don't really want to be president, but everybody said, yes, let him be president. We want him to be president. So instead of seeking power, he was given power. He he writes a letter, I believe, to Governor Morris that says something to the effect, I feel that going to my inauguration is like going to the scaffold. Oh, Uh, I would much rather stay in Mount Vernon be the country gentleman that I am. You've given me a wonderful segue. Oh, I please, hope. please. Uh, I'm supposed to give a speech Sunday on George Washington. Oh. Um, and I have Perfect. just read a fantastic book. Uh, I should tell people that I am I will be doing, or I've done a review for Choice, which mm-hmm. hasn't been published yet. But it's they only give you 190 words. Oh, that's but not enough book, for you. You know, I have written... I've written a two-volume book on the Constitutional Convention. I've written a book on the Declaration of Independence. I've written a book on the Founding Fathers. And the, the Constitutional Fathers, Convention. Lots of others. But this is a book by Jeffrey Rosen, who is president of the National Constitution Center, also uh, a professor at uh, George Washington University. You know anything about that? I do. I went there for my LLM. Okay. Graduated from um, there with it. Anyway, he has written a book called The Pursuit of Happiness, Mm. and the subtitle is actually as important as the title. How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. And there are several books that argue that Greek and Roman thought have had influence on the Founding Fathers. Mm. And I've read them all, or I hope I think I have. Of course you have. Of course you have. But none is as good as this one, Uh, because what he does, he takes 12 virtues, which he largely gets from Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Let me just read off a couple of them, if I can. Order, temperance, humility, industry, frugality, sincerity, Mm. resolution, moderation, tranquility, cleanliness, justice, and silence. And he he shows how the Founding Fathers, and this is before TV, Mm-hmm. Is almost embarrassing, but it it shows how much time each day these men spent. You know, Christians often engage in devotions. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. you read the Bible, pray, meditate on it. These men often two or three hours or more a day would read Cicero mm-hmm. or Pythagoras or mm-hmm. Seneca, uh, largely Stoics. Uh, Epicureans, Christians, and they would try to figure out how to live a virtuous life. More educational than TikTok. Absolutely. I mean, frankly, (laughs) and and I I mean, you know, I I can't say this even about myself, but I don't know a modern politician who spends two hours a day 
reading ancient philosophy in an attempt to gain qualities of temperance and prudence and and whatever. And it, it's sure. it's really it's it's just a striking book. One of the most interesting, by the way. I said we we need to talk about beans, right? Yes, yes. This, this oh my is goodness. okay. Talk about so, the beans. So the, the, the most fascinating portion I read, and you know, I've done a, a bit of classical philosophy. Uh, I knew Pythagoras was good at math. I did not know that much about his his political thought, but his followers they were vegetarians, so they're way ahead of their time. He he didn't believe in killing uh, killing other animals in order to to for one's sustenance. But he also had this peculiar notion that you shouldn't eat beans. Legumes. And in fact, some of his followers were being pursued and they were <laughs> killed rather than going through a bean field for fear that they would trample beans. What? And apparently the reason <laughs> is... So odd. Okay, they thought, apparently, they thought that beans looked like fetuses. <laughs> and that they were embodiments of human yes. souls. For those of you who are on a, our audio versus our video, um, truly, <laughs> Chelsea's reaction yeah, is, she's, is okay. classic. I, I knew this <laughs> discussion of beans, you know, you can go from, from the heights of presidential immunity to beans. You're doing well on the show. I did not know what I expected you to say, but it was not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well... In any event, and you're still now being that, serious. And that is not that is not the main theme of this book, okay? <laughs> but I I raise it because there are so many really little fascinating snippets in here as you're reading along that you find out about the ancients and about Americans. Uh, that is it's it's very it's very fine. He he deals uh, all 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 the favorites. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, John and Abigail Adams, Jefferson, Wilson and Mason, Phyllis Wheatley, um, uh, George Washington, Madison and Hamilton, John Quincy Adams, and then wow. relying on some other books that he's done, Frederick Douglass, Abraham mm -hmm. Lincoln, and there's somebody, oh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, done a, he's done a set of conversations with her. And he brings in how uh, she, you know, also was sort of grounded in something a little bit deeper than, than TikTok. <laughs> no offense to TikTok. <laughs> no, none. <laughs> All right. Let me anyway. bring you back. Before we started this show, you mentioned some kind of surprise. And I feel like we've... Oh, oh no, no. That was it. That, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I, that I, was. It was not right. It, oh, I, I had okay. had something other than H2O or Pepsi. <laughs> okay. Making so. sure that we got that. Okay. Yes. That yeah, was no. a surprise that it was not water. No, it, it was okay. not. And, you know, one other thing we probably should mention. Yes. Um, you know, in American politics, in, in British politics, mm -hmm. the parliamentary system, and there's a new book, by the way, called Parliamentary America that I've just started reading. It talks about this. In Britain, the prime minister, the head of government, is the head of the political party or coalition within Congress. Right. The, the we largest have separation one. of powers, and we have what's known as divided government sometimes, where the president is one party and the majority of Congress is another. Mm. Um, but one of the fascinating things about Britain is they pay very close attention to what what are known as by-elections. So mm. when somebody resigns or dies in office, it becomes a national referendum because if the head of the majority party loses a majority or they give a vote of no confidence, they have to call a new election. And mm. what's fascinating is we are now paying far more attention than we used to to these elections, like this replacement mm. for Santos in New York. Oh, right, where, which is now Democratic. You, know, you have a very, or very Democrat. narrow majority right now in the House of Representatives. And in fact, it was a one-vote majority right. that led to the impeachment of Mayorkas. Well, mm. give it another two weeks. And by the way, the House has been so busy doing nothing that they have now called a, a, a what, do you, what do you call it, a recess I think until like the 25th of the month, but 
literally the day after the impeachment, another Democrat was elected. If that person had been on the floor of the House, chances are you would not have had this impeachment vote. Right. Different Mm -hmm. vote. Uh, Okay. Well, this has been an exciting and interesting discussion. Thank you both for joining me on it. For the hottest legal topics of the week, and we are still at the time of this taping, we are still waiting the judge's decision on the civil fraud case for Trump in New York. Um, If we get that, we'll try to do an update to um, this video and this this podcast. But in the meantime, we wish you a happy Valentine's week. I'm Virginia Tarani. I am joined by Chelsea Rogers, um, and Dr. Vile from Middle Tennessee State University. And we wish you a happy Valentine's and a wonderful week. And we will catch you next time on The Legal Weekly Wine.